All right, so to just remind ourselves of where we left off last, um, last week, uh, we were in the process of creating our first subclass. We were creating a class called fill in question that extends question. Therefore, it's a subclass of, of question. Um, what makes fill in question special, the um, extra behavior it has, is that the question text actually has the answer embedded in it. So here is the example. The inventor of Java is underscore James Gosling underscore. The answer is delineated by the underscore characters. So what we worked our way through so far was the constructor. Um, and in the constructor, the key thing we focused on is that the constructor of a subclass, the first statement needs to be either explicitly or implicitly, and I encourage you to do it explicitly, um, a call to the super classes constructor. So we saw how we use the word super uh, to specify, hey, call my super classes constructor. Which constructor to call? Well, the one that matches the number and types of parameters. In this case, the one that takes one string um, argument. So where we're going to go from here is we're going to look at, okay, like what happens when we call the superclass constructor? Um, so if I open up the question class and I look at that constructor, I can see what this constructor does is it calls the set text method. Um, so I can go look at the set text method. What the set text method does is simply set um, the instance variable text to the specified question text. In our case, for our fill-in question subclass, this isn't the appropriate behavior um, because the answer is embedded within the question text. That would be a problem because then when like the toString method is called, it would actually display the answer along with the question, which isn't what we want. So we need to change the behavior of the set text method. And we do this by overriding it um, to have a different behavior. Okay. So what we're going to focus on today, the, the first new concept for today is the idea of overriding a method. Um, so let's switch back to fill in question. And we're going to override that set text method. And so we should document it first. And in the documentation, we're going to be clear that this method overrides the set text method in the question class. Yes? In the constructor? That's a good question. Um, so we probably normally would write code like here, I'll, I'll do that right here. We would normally write this.txt equals question text. Um, and, and if we did that, if let's say if that was the way it was written, then in the fill in question text, or in the fill in question constructor rather, we, we still have to call super, either implicitly or explicitly. And then we'd have to do something more to change it, right? Because we would have stored the wrong string, right? The string with the answer. Um, and then we would still have to override the set text method because that's going to be called elsewhere and we need to have different behavior too. So this is why, and you may remember this from like from last semester, this is why in general, rather than directly accessing instance variables, um, if we instead use their mutator and accessor methods, it makes it easier to extend later. And here's a great example of that, right? If we're, if we're diligent about using the accessor and mutator methods, which I think we're not quite diligent about, but um, it makes it easier to like override it and change the behavior if we need to. So because it's written this way, and I did this intentionally because I knew what we'd be doing, right? Um, it makes it easier to just have to override the set text method. So um, what is this method going to do? This method is going to, this method sets the question text and the answer because it's both are embedded together. So it takes one parameter called question text. And this is the text of the question 
including the answer. So when we want to override a method, when we want to change the behavior of a method that is inherited, we have to specify the same method header. So what I mean by that is the method has to be called set text, but in addition it has to have exactly the same number and type of parameters. So in this case one parameter of type string. Technically the name of the parameter variable doesn't matter. Um, but often it's the same anyway. So that's what it would look like to override the set text method. I want to clarify something here because this is a source of, of confusion. The word override often gets confused with a previous concept that we did last semester called overloading a method. So just to be clear about that, um, when we have a method in a subclass with the same signature, meaning method name and number and types of parameters, that's overriding the method. We're replacing its behavior with new behavior. Um, the subclass has different behavior than the superclass. If we have methods in a class with the same name, but different signatures, meaning the number and type of parameters are different, um, then we're overloading a method. And that can occur within a single class, or that can occur within a class hierarchy. But that is when we want different methods that both can be called based on passing different arguments, which is totally different than we still just have one method, but its behavior is different based upon which type of object it's called on. Okay. Um, as an example of method overloading, to make this a little bit more concrete, the array list class has the add method, and by default, and there's the add method that takes one parameter, which is just like the reference to the object you're adding to the list. Um, but there's also another version of the add method, an overloaded version of the add method, which has two parameters. The first parameter is the index at which to insert the element, and the second parameter is the element. That's overloading. Two different ways to call the add method on an array list class. What we're doing here is overriding. We are changing, we're going to change the behavior of the set text method when invoked on an object whose type is actually a fill-in question. So it's really easy to accidentally overload a method when you mean to override a method. So as an example, let's say I didn't pay careful attention to the number of type or parameters and I made this an int instead. This doesn't override anything. I just overloaded the set text method. And if that's not what I intended, when I run my code later, I might be surprised that it, it seems like this never gets called. It seems like my code isn't working. This is so common that there's actually a Java annotation to help us detect this. So I, I strongly recommend whenever you're overriding a method, right before the method, use the at symbol and then type override. And what this does is this clues in the Java compiler to say, hey, I'm intending to override this method. And the Java compiler will check and make sure that you're really doing that. And if you're not, it gives you this error message saying, hey, this method actually doesn't override anything. All right. Um, and then I'd be like, oh, that's odd. Why is that? And I check back at the superclass. I'm like, oh, the set text method takes one parameter of type string. Got it. And I would change this to a string. And then it would compile again. So worth putting a little comment here about this at override thing. So use the at override annotation. Annotation is just what we call these at things in Java. We use several of them in our JUnit testing. Um, so use the at in override annotation when overriding a method to help the compiler verify that you are in fact overriding and not overloading by mistake. 
So important tip there. That will save you lots of headaches. So strongly recommend that. All right, so we do need to change the behavior of the set text method. But I want to take a brief detour to share with you um, something that I think is kind of cool and powerful um, and it's definitely an extension for, for this class. We have this string here, for example. The inventor of Java is underscore James Gosling underscore. We need to somehow extract the answer from that string and have the question text left as the inventor of Java is blank, period, and have the answer be James Gosling. And we could certainly do that with a bunch of like char at and substring and other types of stuff. But there's a much easier way to do it using the scanner class. Um, so we've been focused on using the scanner class to read user input through the terminal, based on what they type on the keyboard. But the scanner is much more flexible. The, we don't have to just have the stream be system.in. We can actually have the stream be another string. Um, and the idea of scanning through a string to breaking it into useful chunks, we call that parsing. Um, that's the first step of like compiling our Java program, actually. So let's create a new scanner object. And I'm going to name my variable parser. And I'm going to assign it a reference to a new scanner. But instead of saying system.in, I'm instead going to specify a reference to a string. So now the source, the stream source for the scanner is the string question text. Now if I were just to call next on the scanner, it would return the. And then if I call next again, I get inventor. Um, that would be kind of tedious. What I really would like to do is call next and get everything up to excluding the underscore before James Gosling. And there's a way we can, there's a way we can do that. Um, we do that by changing the default delimiter of the scanner. So I can say parser dot set delimiter and I can specify an underscore character instead. That means the underscore is going to separate my tokens instead of white space, spaces, tabs, returns. So now if I call the next method on the parser, It's going to return everything up to but excluding the underscore. So it's going to return the string, the inventor of Java is space. That's like the first part of my question. And then if I call next again, it's going to return everything from the underscore up to and excluding the next one. It's going to return the answer of just um, James Gosling. Uh, what did I misspell here? Oh, I'm sorry, it's not set delimiter. The method is use delimiter. There we go, that compiles. My mistake. Use delimiter. Finally, if I concatenate to the first part of the question, Whatever is returned, actually first a whole bunch of underscores, I don't know, maybe six of them. And then whatever is returned from parser.next, that string will be the underscores followed by a period because that's all that exists. Now all of this logic assumes that there's only two underscores in our question text. Um, and, ex and exactly two, and that's I'm fine with that assumption. That'll be a limitation of this class. So by using scanner in this way, and by using the use delimiter method, um, it's kind of cool. Like it makes it relatively straightforward to extract the answer out of that question, which is neat. So I wanted to share that with you. All right, so that's our that's our little tangent. So now back to the the concept at hand, this idea of overriding a method. At this point, we know what the question text is. It's stored in the variable question. We know what the answer is. It's stored in the variable answer. So the natural thing to do would be say this.text equals question. 
this dot answer equals answer. But that doesn't compile. We're told that text has private access in question, in the question class. Private, when we specify that an instance variable is private, that means that the only place we can access it is in the class that defines it. We can't access it even, not even in subclasses. Okay. So when you run into this, you might be like, oh, so then I, you know, maybe do I use super in some way? Can I say super.text? Um, and that doesn't work either. We're going to get the same error. Um, so that's not working out the way we want. What students often are tempted to do at this point, they're like, oh, it, it can't find text and answer, so I'm going to go up here to the top of my file, and I'm going to type private string text, private string answer, hey, and everything compiles, and all is right with the world. But it's not. That's why we wrote this comment here, okay? By typing these two lines of code, I just created a second instance variable text and a second instance variable answer. And the one I'm setting down here is the one for this class, but that means the one in the super class never gets initialized. And things are going to break in a really weird and confusing way. So do not do this. This is not how we solve this issue. So I'm going to delete this. Instead, the way we solve this issue, or first let's explain what the issue is. So a little comment block here. The inherited instance variables are private. They cannot be directly accessed. We must use the mutator and accessor methods. So I'm going to comment this out because this does not work. And instead, we have to call the mutator method. So if we want to set the text, we need to call the set text method. So this dot set text question. This should set off some alarm bells. Because we are in the set text method, and if inside that method we call this dot set text, when the highlighted line of code runs, it's going to call this method again. We're going to do all this parser stuff, and then we're going to call the set text method again, which calls the method. We'll do the parser stuff again. We're going to call the set text method again. We just created an infinite loop of sorts. Okay, that's not what we want. What we really want is we want to call this set text method. We want to call the set text method of our superclass that does have the appropriate access to set the text instance variable for us. The way we do this is by using the super reserved word again. We say super dot set text. So we use the super reserved word to call the set text method as defined in the super class. In this case, question. And I appreciate this is a little confusing because the super reserved word is used in two pretty different ways. When we say super dot, we're saying call the super classes version of this method on this object. But up here in the constructor, when we say super parentheses, which we only do in constructors, we're saying call the super classes constructor that takes this number and type of parameters. So the super reserved word is used in two different ways, super parentheses, constructor only, and super dot, whenever we want to call a super class methods implementation instead. That's going to take some getting used to. All right, we're halfway there. 
We have now successfully set the instance variable text by using the mutator method. We also need to set the instance variable answer. Um, the recommended way to do this is to say this dot set answer answer. And a reasonable question might be, well, why wouldn't we say super dot set answer? We just said super dot set text. Um, and if we said super dot set answer, it would work, at least for now. Um, but we should use this reserved word to call the set answer method. And it does work, and this is why it works. If the subclass doesn't override the method, the super classes method will be called. So that's why it works. If we say this dot set answer and this class fill in question doesn't override set answer, it's just going to call the super classes um, set answer method. But why is using this better than calling super? It's really because of avoiding issues in the future. So we don't want to use super in this case because if we later override set answer, the overridden method will not be called, would not be called. Right now, that doesn't matter. We didn't override the set answer. But imagine if next week we realize, oh, we need to override the set answer method for some reason. We may not remember that we had written this code as super.setAnswer. And we might not go back and change it to this dot set answer such that the overridden method is called. And as a result, we'd be really confused when it would appear that the overridden method wasn't being called sometimes. And it's because we're explicitly calling super. So general rule of thumb, when we're invoking methods on a class, just continue to use this like we've used all semester long. The only time to use super is when we is in general is when we are in the overridden method and we're trying to call the super classes implementation of that same method. That's really the only time we really need to call super. Um, and if you follow those guidelines, things are going to work out really well and you're going to avoid really hard bugs to figure out. So. All right, so this should compile. Excellent does. Um, we've, we've written some code. We've talked through some code. Let's actually step through some code um, so we can actually see this at runtime, what happens, because um, that's going to, I think, give us some important insights. So I'm going to open up question demo one. I don't remember why it's called question demo one. And let's, let's change this code a little bit. So the code I provided you originally just creates a new question object and asks who is the inventor of Java. Um, let's refactor this to actually create, instead of a new question, let's create a new fill-in question. And let's specify as the parameter the string with the embedded answer. And then we can get rid of those two things. One thing I want to highlight here, we mentioned this last week, but it, it certainly bears repeating. We're creating a new fill-in question class, or I'm sorry, a new fill-in question object. We're assigning that reference to the variable Q of type question, okay? We're accustomed to the type of the variable matching the type of the object we're creating. That's not the case here. It's okay because a fill-in question is a question. And so therefore, we can assign a reference to a fill-in question object to a variable of type question. So that's why that's OK. Why it's useful, we'll get to later today. But for now, we're going to just be satisfied for the next few minutes that at least it works. Um, the other thing I want to point out is here, we're calling the check answer method on that question object. Okay. 
that's that's all right. We did not override the check answer method. If we look at the check answer method in the question class, it looks pretty good to me. It checks if the specified response is equal to, has the same sequence of characters as the answer in the instance variable. We don't need to change that behavior. So we don't need to override that method. And that's worth being explicit about. So let's do a little comment block here saying the fill in question class inherits the check answer method. We don't need to override it. We don't need to override it because the inherited behavior is what is needed. We only override those methods whose behavior we need to change. Inheriting, oops, inheriting a method improves reliability. That's one of those things we like because it's implemented in one place and it improves developer productivity because we avoid rewriting the same code. Hypothetically, we could have a dozen subclasses of question. Imagine if we had a dozen subclasses, right? We would have to, we would have to imp like we don't want to implement check answer 12 times in the same way. That's a waste of time. One of those 12 times we're probably going to make a mistake and use the equality operator instead of dot equals and then we're going to have another bug to fix. So, only override what we have to override. Let's step through this code. So I'm going to set a breakpoint here where we create our new fill-in question. I'm going to run this. Bring over the debugger. And I'm going to step into the creation of this new fill-in question because I think seeing it happen at runtime is going to help us better appreciate um, these concepts we've been, we've been focused on. So I'm going to step into this. And where I first end up is in the constructor for the fill-in question class. The first statement here is to call the superclasses constructor. So if I step into this again, now I'm in the question class and I'm in its constructor. And that, that's important. We want to make sure we finish constructing the superclass before we do the subclass. Here is something that is often unexpected. We are in the question class we are about to call the set text method. If I step into that, we are now in the fill in question classes overridden version of set text. So even though we were in the question class, we were right here. And even though the set text method is defined right here, Java instead calls the one we overrode. And this is how it does it. What Java does is when a method is called on a variable, whether it's this or not, Java does what is called dynamic method invocation. That's a fancy name for saying Java looks at the value of the variable, and the value of this is going to be a reference to the object in the computer's memory. And it goes to that object and it asks the object, what class are you really from? Yeah, I know the type is question of the variable, but what you could be some subclass. What type are you really? And the object responds, well, I'm really a fill-in question. And the Java runtime says, OK, let me go look at the fill-in question class and see if it overrides the method set text. Oh, it does. We're going to call that instead. And that's dynamic method invocation. And that's a really powerful feature of Java because the type of the variable at runtime doesn't determine which method gets called. It's the type of the underlying object. And we're going to leverage that in, in very powerful ways today and tomorrow. So I just wanted you to actually see that play out. So if I keep stepping through this, so here's all the scanner stuff. So we're going to use a different delimiter. I'm going to read the first part of the question. The inventor of Java is space. I'm going to read the answer. There's the James Gosling. I'm going to read the rest of the question and concatenate it. There's the blanks and the period. That looks really good. 
And here we're about to call the set text method, but we're saying super.setText. So in this case, we're being explicit. No, 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 don't call this overridden set text. Call the superclass set text. Sure enough, when I step in, we're in the superclasses version of set text. We initialize the instance variable as appropriate. Now we're back again. I never called, oh, there's set answer. Now we're back again and we're about to call set answer. When I step into this, again, it does dynamic method invocation. It asks the reference of the actual object. Hey object, what type are you? Says I'm really a fill in question object. It looks in the fill in question class and says, did you override set answer? No, you didn't. So we're gonna just call the super classes version instead. And sure enough, we're in the question class and we're gonna set the answer and that will be specified as appropriate. So simply in the context of going through this constructor, um, we were back and forth between the superclass and the subclass over and over again. And that's going to take some getting used to, right? There's a lot of, of nonlinear jumps here in terms of which methods are being called. So we're going to keep practicing that. So I'm going to open up choice question. So here's some... We're going to look for similarities and differences. Compare and contrast choice question to fill in question. Choice question is also a subclass of question. And we see that by where we say choice question extends question. So that's a similarity. Here's a difference. Choice question has its own instance variable. It has an array list of strings called choices. Now choice question doesn't duplicate the question text or the question answer instance variables. That's important. That's just like fill in question, but it has an additional instance variable because being a multiple choice question, it needs to know all the choices. Um, it has a constructor that takes one parameter of type string, just like fill in question. It calls super, just like fill in question, but it also has to initialize its array list choices, and it does that as, as well. But it does have to call super first. Your first statement must be the call to super. If we look at choice question, we next see there's this method add choice. This is a brand new method. This doesn't override anything. Um, the add choice method is a new method, and that's fine. Subclasses can declare totally new methods. Not everything has to be an overridden method. Um, and this is where basically it, it adds the, each of the choices to its list. And if the choice is marked as being the correct choice, it updates the answer as, as well. Just like fill in question, it can't set the answer variable, instance variable directly. It has to use the mutator method set answer. Um, and then finally, it has the two string method. And actually, this is overriding it. So I probably should have put at override here because um, it is overriding the superclasses two string method. And it needs to do that because, well, displaying the question text is fine. So it can just call the super class to do that. Um, but then it needs to go through all the choices in the list and print each of them out. And this is something pretty common here, this idea of seeing super dot two string. I would, I would say more often than not, when we override a method, we still want some part of the super classes method. So we often call explicitly the superclasses method in the overridden method. In this case, we call the superclasses methods first, and then we do a bunch of other stuff. In the case of fill in question, we did a bunch of other stuff, and then we called the superclasses method. Um, both, both occur, both are fine. It just depends upon the, the situation. Let's write a little bit of code about choice question in our demo class here. So let's actually create a new question Q2 equals new choice question. Who founded Apple? And I'm going to make one minor change and I'll put it back later. I just want to illustrate something to you all. Whoa, not bad. 
All right, so back to the demo thing. Um, so we're creating a new choice question object. And I'm going to set a breakpoint on that because I want to step through the construction of, of choice question. So switching over to run this thing. Prompts me for the answer. I'm going to ignore that part. There's the debugger. So what I want to show you is if we step into choice question, don't know why it's doing that. If we step into choice question, um, here we are in the constructor for choice question. I deleted the explicit call to the superclass constructor. Um, I did that just for a moment because I want to show you that even if we don't call super, there's no call to super here. If I keep stepping in, the Java runtime is still going to call the superclass constructor. It's just going to call the default constructor. And that may not be what we want. In this case, it's not because the instance variable never gets initialized. What's that? I mean, well, like we didn't explicitly write this. There's still a default constructor. Like if we don't write a default constructor, Java writes one for us. Um, and the, why does it do that? Because it needs to be able to call it if we have a subclass. So there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to still do stuff, probably not what we want. So again, my recommendation, again, um, explicitly call that, that constructor instead. All right, so I'm going to put that back. All right, let's go back to the demo, though, and actually add some choices to this. So we have new choice question, who founded Apple? Let's give it some possible answers. We can say Q2 dot... I'm, yeah, q2 dot add choice uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates did not find found Apple. That is false. We could go to q2 dot add choice Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was one of the founders or is one of the founders of Apple. That is true. What we've run into here. is an important difference between the Java runtime and the Java compiler. If we try to compile this, it doesn't compile. It says it can't find the symbol add choice. And the reason for that is what the Java compiler does and can assume versus what the Java runtime has access to. From a Java compiler perspective, when we call a method on a variable, when we call the method add choice on Q2, the Java compiler looks at Q2 and says, what type is it? It's a question. So then it's going to look in the question class and check, is there an add choice method in here? Hmm, no. Does this class inherit an add choice method? No, it doesn't. So this isn't going to compile. There is no add choice method defined. At compile time, there's no such thing as dynamic method invocation. We don't really know what value Q2 has. Right? In this case, we can kind of tell it's pretty clear, but there are many, many cases when it's not. So if we want to call a method, the type of the variable has to have defined that method. So we're going to have to change question to choice question if we want this to compile. All right, so we're going we're gonna to end with just a teaser for tomorrow. Because a very reasonable question is, why all this inheritance stuff? Why, don't, why wouldn't I make this a fill-in question? What is the value of being able to assign references to choice questions and fill-in questions to variables of type question? How does that actually help? So We're going to create a new class, and we're just going to write a few comments together. We're going to create an exam class. So, so go ahead and create a new exam class. And we're going to import a couple of things that we'll use tomorrow, but we might as well do it since we're right at the top of the file. Let's import java.util.arraylist. Let's import java.util.scanner. We'll use those later. And let's describe what an exam is. 
Well, if I asked you for a definition of an exam, you'd be like, well, it's, it's a whole bunch of questions, right? So an exam has a list of questions. I'll put my GitHub stuff here for today's date. Oh my, it's already February. And I'll get rid of all this template stuff. But our exam class has a list of questions, meaning I'm going to have an instance variable, which will be an array list of question objects called questions. And honestly, this bears repeating because despite writing classes just like this all year, now that we're use, learning inheritance, we get really confused about when to extend and when not to extend. So I want to emphasize that an exam object has a list of questions. An exam object is not a question. Two weeks ago, you all would have no problems writing the definition for this class. You'd be like, oh, OK, I need to write an exam class. Yeah, it's going to have a list of questions. You declare it, we'd move on. But now that we've learned about inheritance, until we get more comfortable with it, students want to make everything a subclass. And so a lot of students write public class exam extends question. Because everything else extends question, so this might as well too. But when we say extends question, that means that an exam is a question. An exam isn't a question. An exam has questions. So that's why we just say public class exam. We're not extending anything. Rather, it has an instance variable, which is a list of questions. Um, literally, in your head or out loud, I don't care, asking yourself this question when you're making a new class, does this question, is this new class, is it something? Or does it have something? And seeing which one makes sense will save you tremendous amount of trouble. So, all right, we're going to stop there. Commit and push your changes to GitHub. Tomorrow we'll finish up the exam class and actually learn about what this thing called polymorphism is.